る。Good evening. Thank you for joining us for the annual PTA Council Board of Education Candidate Forum. My name is Mary Monzone, PTA Council President-elect. Before we begin, I would like to share who we are. PTA Council is the governing body that provides services to our local PTA units. 
Our function helps build stronger, more effective units by offering training, coordinating communication, communications among units, engaging and coordinating in community-wide projects beyond the scope of a single unit, as well as providing strength to unify planning efforts to solve community-wide issues. As a public service, PTA Council hosts this forum every year. We believe informed citizens are responsive citizens who will strive for better schools and a better community. All of the questions we asked tonight will have come directly from our PTA units. With us tonight is Beth Sanderson, PTA Council Secretary, who will be co-moderator, and Valerie Cadet Simpson, PTAC VP, who will be the timekeeper this evening. This year, we have four candidates running for two board positions. Ms. Lewis, no, I'm supposed to read them in the proper order, sorry. Uh, that's on this page, apologies. Donald Vega, Ms. Lewis, Mr. Malfatano, and Mrs. Farage. Beth will now go over the format for tonight. Hi, welcome everyone. Um, so the format for tonight is that um, each candidate is allotted two minutes for opening statements, three minutes for closing statements, and two minutes for each of the questions asked. All candidates will be asked the same questions, will read the question, and will go in an order that was drawn previously, rotating through. Each person gets to go first and will rotate through. There is no additional time allotted for rebuttals. You can use your closing statement for additional comment or rebuttal. Um, opening statements will begin with the person drawn first, which is Mr. Vega. We're sitting in the order we will go in. And please note that this forum is being live streamed and recorded to be shared on any and all formats available to PTAs, including social media. Thank you. Do you want to do a question? Yeah. Okay. Um, we'll start with opening statements. Mr. Vega, two minutes. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming here tonight. Uh, and I see like there's at least 20 people here, or maybe, maybe. So that's a that's a great turnout for New Rochelle. So I appreciate you all. For, uh, coming out tonight. Every student in our public education system deserves an equal chance at realizing their potential, no matter what their background is, whether they're a special ed student that needs special services in their district, whether it's a student that lives on a certain side of town and maybe their English is not their first language whether a student lives in another part of town that's not near any school and it lacks those resources there. I've been a parent in the system now for more than 12 years. My son is a, a special ed student, Lucas. He's been from Barnard to, to Columbus, to Isaac, to the high school, and now at BOCES. And I've seen um, the experiences, especially for special ed students, uh, which would be my priority on day one. But we have an opportunity now uh, we have a new superintendent. We have funding to really lean into a lot of things, really giving more resources for in the classroom, uh, specifically even more pay for our student aides who haven't received a raise since 2009, to, to get in fully in compliance with special education for our district. And then that also would include all of the students getting any kind of IEP, to give more support to our teachers, to give them more uh, professional support. This, this is the time where we can, we can really lean into those things and create the feedback loop where we can really exchange more with the community. Board of Education's job is not to tell teachers how to teach or to interfere in the classroom. Our job is to create the support structure, the infrastructure to really give students and the teachers the resources they need so we can help students, especially the students that are in most need. I ask you to join with me in this campaign That's so we can time. make this change. Ms. Lewis. Hi, hello, everyone. First and foremost, thank you for all for, for coming. Um, I appreciate being here. Can, can everyone hear me? Keep us fingers. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm from New Rochelle, as many of you are probably aware. Um, I do Albert Leonard. I went to Ward. I went to the high school. 
So um, I think I bring a unique perspective of what it's like to go through the school system here. Um, and I'm not terribly far removed. As you probably can tell, I look fairly young. Um, and so those experiences I keep with me and have been my guiding star in terms of what I would like me and Michelle to be in the future, um, as well, of course, as talking to all the parents and students that I've met along the way in this journey. So, um, excuse me. So uh, I think I've been innovative since then. Um, way back in the day, I was elected treasurer at Albert Leonard. I was elected president of GEO when I was in the high school. And I'm here before you to be elected one more time to serve uh, for a community that I love um, and that I've been a part of my entire life. Uh, I left, of course, to go off to college. I went to UMass Amherst, um, where I had the chance to uh, be innovative there. And I, I started programs to encourage students to study abroad. Uh, I also went to teacher's college to get my master's degree at Columbia University in higher education administration. And so uh, even there, I, was, I went to Barbados to speak to their education uh, uh, board of education and see what they do in terms of innovation in their schools. And so my idea of what we can do is international. Um, including the experience that I had myself when I studied abroad. Um, and now that I'm back, I've worked in educa education this entire career. Um, I've worked in the boarding school and day school fields. And of course, I work in public schools and I've worked for the Board of Education now for New York City, where I've taken lots of data and given really innovative solutions to problems that superintendents are facing. So I work directly with superintendents and principals and advising and coaching teachers um, and supporting teachers, particularly our new teachers in their first year and onboarding support to make sure they have everything they need to be successful in the classroom. Mr. Malfitano. You have to hold it down. I got to hold it. Okay. All right. Uh, well, uh, good evening, everybody. Ms. Monzone and PTA folks, thanks for hosting this. Uh, it's, it's always good to see that we try to get some people out here. Uh, it is a shame that after three years, our school district hasn't figured out how to get the optimum cable system working. A lot of senior citizens don't know how to live stream, so a whole audience is going to be deprived. But that's something I'd like to work on if I got elected. But in any case, a little bit about me. I uh, got my uh, bachelor's in uh, education from NYU in 72, master's in special ed uh, from College of New Rochelle in 77, my superintendent certification from PACE, and then my law degree from PACE. My family and I have been in town for about 45 years. Our children attend our schools. Many of you know me as a longtime, very active community member and see me at many board meetings and elsewhere, uh, very active with our community and, and a lot of, lot of, of its endeavors. I'm a, an attorney, recently retired after about 40 years as a classroom teacher, school administrator with New York City, very involved in strategic planning on issues involving security, curriculum. I was part of the committee uh, with the small school movement in New York City for better or for worse, a lot of in-depth, hands-on kind of uh, work. Um, all of us want our kids uh, to be uh, safe in school and to grow in a community known for good schools. School board members must be willing to, to engage and work with parents and all New Rochellians to secure safe and vibrant schools. More than ever, we need open-minded people on our school board with diversity of thought. After my many decades of participation, I am retired. I have the time. I was able to meet with practically every school leader in New Rochelle uh, to go over some of their concerns. They have all advised me of uh, some of their issues, and I hope to talk about them tonight. Ms. Farage. Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Lydia Farage. Um, I'm a proponent of strong education system because it lays the foundation for our future. It feeds the passion in our children that it's needed to create a world that reflects values instilled by their teachers, role models, coaches, and parents. I am a mom of two children and a longtime resident of New Rochelle. Together with my husband present here, we raised two successful children in this beautiful city. My daughter attended and graduated from Northeastern University and is now a doctor of physical therapy. At her young age of uh, 25, she is the only physical therapist full-time on a 120 
bed uh, rehab facility. My son is graduating Friday from Purdue University, Indiana, with a degree in uh, civil engineering. I feel very blessed to have had the opportunity to raise my children to be confident and successful with the ability to choose and create their own future. I was not myself so fortunate having been born and raised in a communist country, Romania. We are restricted in many, many ways and constantly monitored by the government for subversive activities, which in my time were reading, listening to music, and thank you, uh, and re reading books. Uh, if, if lucky enough to be elected on this board, I will work in a collaborative way and engage in com with community leaders, parents, and educators to identify and remedy issues at the early stages of the educational process, promote common sense curriculum and rigorous education for all while recognizing each individual needs. I will include, I would like to have included in the curriculum healthy values such as respect. That's time. Thank you, Ms. Faraj. All right, so we'll start, Ms. Lewis, you'll answer question one first. This question is for all the candidates. Is there a particular interest or issue that motivates you to serve on the Board of Education? In your opinion, how would you characterize the relationship and the role of the Board of Education with respect to the administration? Two minutes. Uh, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I'll answer them in, in pieces. Uh, so for the first question, um, I know that I've, I've come across many different uh, concerns that parents have had across this uh, and our, our students as well in terms of overcrowding. I think um, when we think of uh, busing, when we think of transportation, we think of there's no school in the Lincoln School area, we think of um, City Hall now being available. Uh, and what we can do to support students who, um, like uh, Don was mentioning, there are in BOCES, students who want to be a part of BOCES that can't and um, aren't able to, and just expanding the opportunities that we can give our students uh, across New Rochelle. Uh, and I think um, in terms of working with administration, it's all connected, right? So when you're thinking about um, how you work with the superintendent, as I mentioned before, I work with superintendents during my day job, but uh, now that we have someone new that's coming in, it's really imperative that we all work together as a team to really think about the strategic plan that's already been put forth, um, the budget that we're voting on on May 16th, uh, and think about where the, the areas are of opportunity within that to create a brighter future for New Rochelle and see um, where the opportunities are moving forward. So um, we do have, I think, a great um, a great advantage. I think uh, the board has done a great job this year in terms of doing those two things. And if we can use that to leverage us moving forward, we can get uh, to a place where we don't feel as though our schools are overcrowded, where we are comfortable with uh, the busing situation in Rochelle, where we are comfortable with um, the opportunities we have in terms of building equity into what that looks like um, and making sure that everyone still has uh, a similar school experience across New Rochelle and they have a chance to partake in all the all the advantages that we that we had um, that I had that I would hope that the next generation has uh, in terms of being part of that community and feeling like this is all uh, one neuro even though they might be in different parts of your show Mr. Malfitano oh yes uh, a couple of things um, most of my background was in special education that's my training and my work um, that's an area of uh, particular interest for me as you may know for many years, our special ed population was about 10% of the total, but it's been climbing rather rapidly to now about 16%. I was at a meeting the other night in this room where a few parents complained about busing. Uh, busing, by the way, is the largest item increase in our budget, a 25% increase. Uh, we need to get some answers about that. But the real question about this is, parents aren't getting served with the busing. Buses don't come, all kinds of issues. And in terms of the services provided, so I, I'd be a strong advocate in that regard. But a couple of other things that do concern me, um, mostly uh, dealing with time on task, I call it. I know that uh, uh, Albert Leonard had to recently revise their start time by a half an hour, uh, period begins at nine o'clock rather than 8.30, because again, busing issues, kids can't get there on time, okay, uh, now, Ms. Thomas and others worked on it, and uh, they didn't uh, extend the day, but what they did do was take away four minutes from every class period. Now, is that a monster problem? Well, I'm told, well, we meet the state requirements. Is that good enough for New Rochelle? 
So there are issues we need to look at, okay? A lot of issues, that's only the beginning of them. One other area that really uh, concerns me uh, is our advocacy for state change. Something as simple as, and I'll ask you this and maybe address it in more time later, do you have the right to speak at a school board meeting? The answer is no, you don't. Only if they graciously give you the privilege. I've suggested amending the open meetings law to require every public meeting schedule a minimum of a half an hour of That's public That's time, speaking. thank you. I'd advocate for that. Mrs. Farage, same question. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure. I'm sorry. Is there a particular interest or issue that motivates you to serve on the Board of Education? In your opinion, how would you characterize the relationship and the role of the Board of Education with respect to the administration? Thank you. Um, the reason I want to serve on the board, it's of the civic nature. I feel like I, I've been so lucky and I'm so grateful having had the opportunity to live in this town and to raise my children in this beautiful, beautiful city of ours. Um, that I, I, I want to give back to the community um, in any way possible. Um, New Rochelle schools were once a blue ribbon schools. I don't know if the designation still, um, it's still applicable. Um, so that's my motivation for, for, for serving on the board. In terms of the uh, relationship between the board and the administration, I think that there are many, many, many issues that um, my, my my, my coming to place in terms of uh, the collaborative work between administrative personnel, parents, and educators. Um, additionally, I, I feel like I would like to see um, community leaders getting involved and assisting um, with their expertise um, in educating our children and bringing forth some of their knowledge from their own businesses and experiences to uh, enrich the board's collaborative action. Thank you. Mr. Vega? Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, this is, this is the easiest question for me. So I thank you for that right at the beginning because it all has to start with special education and any student that receives an IEP in the district. We cannot call ourselves any type of worthy school district if special ed students are not getting their required services as per, as per outline of their IEP. The students are getting their services in the hallways because there's no space. That we have a sensory gym that's been in Albert Leonard now for three years and no one's put it together. That it could have helped all the students. That one, well not one out of, that 25 cents out of every dollar of our special ed dollars is being shipped out of the district. $9 million for the next year because we can't give them the services in our district. So we end up, we're gonna pay multiple times now to pay for that outside of the district. And touching upon the, their role of the, of the board in terms of the district is a perfect example because the board is responsible for special education and making sure that the entire district is following the state policy. That includes reporting, that includes making sure that every single student has their services, that makes sure students, every single student has their space, that makes sure that every student, student has the same access to everything in the district that a typical student would like the pool and the fields. So there is a special, that, that is my special interest. And when I say that I'm committed to this, that day one, there'll be a full review of special education in this district per the board to ensure that we are in full compliance with New York state law. As soon as they swear me in, I'll be making calls that night. Because when I see the next kids coming, and I'm hearing it from others too, my son is not even in a district anymore. And I'm hearing it from other parents, the same thing that my son went through and I went through. That's time. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Malfitano, you will have the first question now. Name one thing that the Nourishell BOE has done that you think is strong and you want to make sure it continues. Name one constructive criticism of the 
Nourishell Board of Education that you would like to contribute to improving if elected? Oh, Mr. Malfitano. Okay. Well, this may sound like a simple thing, but the one thing that seems to be working very well is the home call system. Now that's not a major item, but uh, I get a call, oh, Mr. Malfitano, your daughter was not in first period, was, there was a problem with attendance. And then you get an email, okay, oh, she wasn't in first, okay. Well, that's a simple item, but uh, some, of the, some of the more important items that uh, I think uh, we do need to take a look at is our, uh, I, I mentioned it a minute ago, and you can't always know the problems that pop up, but wouldn't you like to know that a board of ed would not be permitted to shut you out from your own board? That you'd actually be able to go there and speak your mind for a few minutes with civility. But I've asked and I've gone to the advocacy committee and I've asked them out of the many things they advocate, they refuse to take it up. I, I, it doesn't cost any money. Advocate to your state representatives to change the open meeting law. So that you citizens and residents of New Rochelle have the absolute right, maybe for half an hour of time to be allotted to speak at a public meeting. Mr. Iannuzzi, when he became board president, actually told the audience something which not many people knew, but I did. And here it is, quote, New York state law does not require that we permit you to speak at our meeting. Well, what if there's a topic on your mind that you'd like to speak about, but this particular board doesn't really wanna hear you. So let's open our community and make it transparent and welcome our public by advocating for that. I'll ask our board members. I'd like to work with them as a team player. That's time. And try to get this done. Mrs. Farage. Well, our kids have been out of the school system for quite a few years since they finished college. But uh, I recall that one of the uh, attractions to this particular school district for us when we moved here was the magnet system that existed in all the elementary school schools at the time. Um, we were in Davis, they had the great arts programs. Uh, I believe the SILA program was, was fabulous. I'm sorry we did not have a chance to participate into it, but uh, those were programs that I really, really appreciated. Uh, additionally, I feel New Rochelle's school system in general, I, uh, it's a very, very safe system, a school system. Uh, I know there have been incidents of violence in schools and outside schools. However, we have not had the, uh, the magnitude of the uh, violence that uh, plagued other school districts all over uh, the country. So to that respect, I'm very grateful for the job done by everybody around. In terms of what I'd like to see more happening will be um, the board uh, should select a superintendent who hopefully will stay longer than a few months or a year in, in, in place. And we could return to a more merit-based approach in our education, uh, not just passing students uh, for quote unquote effort. Um, education should be more rigorous and standards should be held higher. The education bar should be raised up and not uh, lower to accommodate uh, everybody. We should work harder to bring everybody up. Thank you. Mr. Vega. Yeah, thank you. The, and the board, the board are nice people, right? We like the board and we're not, um, it's not a knock on the board because if the problem was the board, then over the past five or 10 years, then problems would have changed, right? Because we, we pretty much, we half of the board has been um, replaced, more than half of the board has been replaced in the past just few years. What the board does well is what boards would typically do, right? Hire, hire a superintendent, pass a budget, put all, make sure all the line items are in the budget as, as they should be. The, the basic things that we see around district, and I'm not saying basic into knock it, you know, because there's a lot of great things going on, right? And a lot of students are benefiting from it, especially 
the high performing students, right? And we see that and we want to lift them up. What the criticism would be not having that acceleration. It seems like that we, every time that we, we're moving forward, but we're still like kind of digging in sand that we need to be a little bit more faster and smarter in how we engage the community. And also like, like we talked about building infrastructure around the district based on the community's feedback. We need more, more of that feedback loop going where the community can even write letters to the board or let the students write letters to the board, have non-voting student representation on the board having having some more of that engagement because then you'd really be able to see well where where are the challenges in the community and how can how can we address them as the board the board is only supposed to represent the interests of the community not like what i think this is not like my campaign this is a campaign based on all the issues that we've been talking about for the past few years and we just don't seem to get enough traction on it that's what we that's what we need to happen and that's what i'm promising to be committed to. Thank, Thank you. you. It's a good crowd, by the way. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised. Miss Lewis. Um, I'm actually gonna be expanding on uh, the answer that Don just gave. I, I had the pleasure of attending both the, uh, the SEPTA and the Youth Bureau events this past week. Um, and for me, being able to see the community come together um, across New Rochelle and really celebrate all of our teachers, celebrate our students um, for doing amazing things. I think um, at, a, at a very micro level, uh, we take a lot of pride in New Rochelle. And so it was great to be able to see people, um, you know, just really emphasize that in, in public and in showing for other support for other people so that the word gets out uh, and in showing what we do. And I think in that same vein, what I also enjoyed had been attending the, the board meetings and seeing no matter what school we go to, the school that the board meetings held at presents on what they're doing and that's what they're they're proud of, right? So they, they share with the board all the things that they've accomplished lately and, and some really big things and everyone seems to really enjoy that. And so um, in, in line with that, I think uh, moving forward, what I would like to see is really just a sharing of those ideas. Um, when, I, when I attend those meetings, I think like, you know what, it would be amazing if this presentation wasn't just for the board, but maybe there was a separate day where all the schools get together and share amongst themselves so that Jefferson's talking to Barnard and Ward is talking to Davis and they get to innovate amongst themselves and, and get to share these ideas that it's not just within the board and that the board is hearing, but all the new shells getting to hear. Um, and I think in that, with, in doing that, we'd also free up some of the agenda time. I know I've spoken to a lot of parents and students about the length of the time of the, the board meetings and really wanting to focus that down. So I think that's a, an area where you can do that. Um, you're making room for innovation. You're, you can put up QR codes to save some paper. There are a lot of things that you can do in that space. Um, and at the same time, you'll still be able to, to, to kind of think about redesigning how those work so that people don't have to worry about the board meetings ending very late because they'll get all the information they need to know within a certain time frame and that they can trust in that time frame and know that, that it's transparent. Um, and that transparency is going to encourage young folks to run in the future. It's going to uh, convince other folks in all parts of your shell to run as well, um, knowing that they can trust that. Thank you. All right, question three, Mrs. Farage, we'll start with you. How would you help to make the board more transparent and engaging with the community and stakeholders? Great question. Um, I think that one way to uh, make the board more transparent is to have a greater audience to the board, um, to the board's meetings, to the board's agenda, to the board's resolution. Um, I know people try to uh, avoid coming to boring long meetings, but maybe it will be a, a, a way to uh, broadcast the, uh, the the meetings and maybe um, mailings to the uh, to the residents um, regarding the minutes and the issues. Also, I feel like in some ways, um, from what I'm hearing here today. Um, it's not a great representation of the whole city of New Rochelle. I feel like um, there are issues specific to some areas, and it doesn't seem that we are addressing the, the whole the whole district as, as a whole and not just parts of it. So um, I feel that invitation should be extended to the, to the whole community when the board meeting meets and the issues that are being addressed should be listed uh, clearly so everybody can uh, have a say in it. Thank you, Mr. Vega. Yes, thank you. The best, 
the best way to be be more transparent and more engaging is just to do it, you know, to be more transparent and make it a lot more easier for everyone. There's we kind of we kind of get into you know a cycle where it gets kind of harder, things get harder, even like to make a public meeting, they they schedule both meetings on the same date, you know, when it's the city and, and the school board. You know, it's, it we have to make it easier for parents to engage, right? We can't tell them, well, you got to show up at this meeting. We can't tell teachers, right? You got to work harder. We can't tell the students, well, you need to work harder. It's your fault. We have to make, we have to get smarter in it that we do things. And if we give more information to the community in basic language, right? Like just like the budget, the budget should be something that's like, you know, a 10 page PDF. And then you could just forward it to, to any parent and they would be able to read it and really understand what's in the budget. You know, and then there should be a separate one that highlights special ed or highlights a certain a certain area of, of the district. We don't we don't see enough of that. If if anyone has seen the budget presentation, I've seen multi billion dollar companies have investor calls that are simpler and more easier to understand than the budget presentation. It's not it's not that complicated to to do. And when people see that, you know, even public we're talking about public comment. Who wants to go public comment at nine thirty at night? You know, I'm not even this fired up at 9.30 at night. I'm ready, I'm ready to go to sleep at, at 9.30 at night. And if we want people, we want parents to show up. We want teachers to show up, students. This, this, is, this is what kind of like hinders engagement. Just like if city council schedules a meeting on the same day as a BOE meeting, that, that just hinders engagement. We have to make things easier, more convenient. Let, let people, like, like we said, write letters to the board. Send me a text and then read it to the board. If, if we do these things, then parents will begin to appreciate, teachers begin to appreciate because they're gonna say, oh, my opinion matters. Oh, I was heard. And that's how you're gonna get more people engaged in the process itself. It's time. Thank you. Ms. Lewis. Yes, I, uh, I, I know I just briefly uh, actually answered that question. So I'll try to, to build off my previous answer as well. I think um, I agree that we need to meet parents where they are. Uh, in my previous job, um, I worked with parents who had multiple jobs that did not have the time to, to come down to the office and meet with us. But it was imperative that we spoke to them about their students and what they were doing well, what they need to improve upon. Um, and so we brainstormed and uh, collectively as a group, um, as I would like to do moving forward as well, to, to still do things collectively, um, is think about where and what you can do to, to meet them where they are. So it, it looked like at that point it was a text message listserv. Um, we're at the beginning of the school year, our schools ask for the parents' cell phone number, and then every six months they would check in and say like, hey, did your number change? That's it. That's the only question you have to answer for me. Um, and then that mess text message chain basically would just send out flyers that were upcoming or um, announcements that they need to know. Very brief one-liners, less than a tweet, um, so that people would be engaged. And I think if we can start with something that's very simple, even if it's in terms of putting what we put on the website to make it very clear um, about what's upcoming as well, uh, it could be a text message, it could be not be, but I think if we if we take the time to think about um, what t parents are looking at, maybe they're not on Facebook anymore, maybe their kids are on Instagram or on TikTok, and then their kids will come to, um, you know, if they're in high school, can tell their parents what's going on. I think there's different ways to get innovative, uh, making sure the agendas are, are clear and are easy to read and accessible as well on the website um, would also be another way to to make sure everyone's getting the same information um, and has a chance to ask questions. I think generally, um, when I speak to folks, it's hard for them to understand what's going on at the board. They don't really know what's what's new, what's latest. And so making sure that they're, we're, we're sharing information as often and as, as easily as possible. Um, and again, uh, shortening the time of the meetings, making them easier to understand and people for participating. You can call in, even in terms of uh, videoing, when I, I tried doing it myself on Zoom and you can't actually see the screen when they're sharing the budget video. And so if you're calling in on Zoom thinking, oh, I can't make it, but I'm gonna use a Zoom, it doesn't work. Thank you. Mr. Malfitano. Yes, well, unfortunately, uh, we're, we're bearing witness to the lack of engagement as we speak. Uh, this meeting will not be seen by many people in town because our cable systems don't work. Only Verizon came up recently. The system has been down for three years. A lot of folks don't stream and the entire population who uses cable is out of the loop. The election is in a week. Do you know how ridiculous this is, folks? But you're happy with it. The eight or nine percent of you do vote that really run this place. You're happy with it. You don't want to change it because you're successful. It's not very helpful to the democratic process, but I understand it. And that's how it works. But if you're happy with the results we've been getting in our district, 
if you have no concerns and you're happy with the status quo, uh, Mr. Vega and Ms. Lewis will win the election. The various political forces in town will see to that. And that's okay, that's, that's democracy so-called. But you might wanna consider some other alternatives to try to bring a little bit of other thought to our board. If the students who need our help, the ones who can't afford the tutors, the kids that live on Horton Avenue or Winthrop really want a full day of school, you might want to elect a guy like me. But this is how it's going to be. If you want engagement, let's change the open meetings law. It doesn't cost a dime and make sure people have the right to speak. Why don't they want to do that? They want to have the ability to say to this community, I'm so sorry, we're going to have to cancel public speaking if they get offended by somebody who comes and talks about busing or special education or some other issue. Is that the board you want? Is that the board members who are gonna get elected? They won't carry it, I don't think. But look, this is your board. If you're happy with a secret election in a 20 day notice, you go right ahead. Keep That's electing time. the same old folks. Thank you. Mr. Vega, you're first this time. Okay, the question, when you hear inclusion, diversity, and equity, what does it mean to you? How can you use your role as a BOE member to ensure inclusion and equity for all children? This is a great question because I'm actually, I'm proud. I'm proud to say I support diversity, um, equity, and inclusion. I don't, I don't know why that's some, some places that, that that seems like it's some sort of a dirty word. Diversity, inclusion, and equity means that the special education student gets what they need, even if that is going to cost twice the amount that a typical student would take. Who's going to tell me that that student can't get that, that it's unfair to some other student? Equity, is, equity says that if, if some kid on one side of town gets something, that it's not on at the expense of some other kid on the other side of town, which we seem to have that sort of canard here in Rochelle that that every time that somebody gets that it's at the expense of somebody else. That's just a myth. That's just a way to just keep us, you know, spinning. We got plenty of money. Money is not a problem in New Rochelle. That's the one thing that we got to our advantage compared to other districts. I'm, I'm sorry, would you repeat the question again? I got fired up here. Sure. When you hear inclusion, diversity, and oh, equity. Yeah, the inclusion and diversity. The, the, other part, the other part of that is, sorry, is that we need to hire more teachers that look like our students and look like the student base that we have. Because the data shows that if you do that, you're going to, that's when you're going to get that incremental difference. The same way, the same that when I was a kid, we had all, we had all women teachers, but then we had a couple of male teachers and those, those teachers were the ones that were like the role models to me and to the other, the other small you know, boys or young men. So diversity, equity, and inclusion is not a dirty word. It means fairness to everyone, depending on your circumstances. We need more of this in our education system. We need more of this in our country instead of making it as if it's somehow it's to divide us in some way. Thank you very much. Ms. Lewis. Uh, so I'll actually start this question where, where Don left off. And so, um, as I mentioned before, I work for the largest school district in the country. And currently in the last two years, I had a chance to be, um, be co-lead on a project that created resources for principals. And this resource created principal or created a document for principals that helped them um, hire equitably across all grades. And so this is a first of its kind document. This takes them from the interview process in terms of how they find candidates to interview in the first place, um, all the way through onboarding. Um, and so making sure that the entire process is equitable th um, throughout. So I don't see why um, New Rochelle can't have something similar, um, why we can't support our principals in, in that decision-making process. Um, I don't know if anything currently exists, but it could take a look at and see if there's any improvements that could be made along that, along that path. Um, and there are two other things that I want to mention for, for this in terms of equity. Uh, the first is that I was speaking to a parent about um, the free lunch program, and she was mentioning that um, even though, well, as you all know, 56% of our students are economically disadvantaged, but her student as well had a free lunch program, and she was saying that it was really hard because he had to stand in a separate line to get lunch. And I was thinking that, you know, that, that really story really stuck with me because it's really disheartening that um, even though you need to, you need help, you have to stand in a separate line. Like, all of our students are equal, and I think that, you know, doing things on the board to show our students that we consider them equal is one of the small things that we can do to make their day easier and give them one less thing to think about, one less thing to worry about at school. 
Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention is that I spoke to another parent about um, IEPs and supporting learning, uh, students with learning disabilities. Um, I also established a coalition that supported uh, teachers uh, in terms of making sure that they're onboarded properly to support students with IEPs and to support students with, with uh, special education concerns. And this is also a brand new, and a uh, brand new initiative. And so um, making sure that we have teachers um, um, that have all the access and resources that they need to support students who have IEPs, so that they're not just simply getting the designation, but teachers know what to do once they have the, that designation. Thank you. Mr. Malfatano. Yes, I'm a very strong supporter of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, the question is, uh, how do we define all these things, of course? And that's where the devil is in the details. But I'll just tell you a little story. Many years ago, when I graduated NYU in 72, I thought I'd become a social worker. So I applied to some schools. I went out to an interview at Stony Brook out in Long Island, sat around a table with about 12 other applicants, a couple of present students, and a professor who went on and on talking about the school and what the kind of student they're looking for. And they kept using a phrase that's popped up a lot in our district, uh, change agents. We're looking for people to be agents of change and so on and so on. Okay. So it went on, a couple of people started asking questions and I raised my hand and said, can you please tell me, what do you mean by uh, change agent? And he says, well, what prompts your question? I said, well, I'd like a little more detail as to what you're talking about. And he says, well, how do you mean? And I said, well, uh, I can think of a lot of people who were agents of change, uh, the disciples of Christ were agents of change, but so were the black shirts and brown shirts of Mussolini and Hitler. I said, who are you talking about? So when I hear school board members saying upon their elevation to office, I want our children to become, quote, social justice warriors, unquote. Okay, who are you talking about? What are you talking about? You know, everybody wants to be treated fairly and equitably, but I go back to Dr. King's old words, judge me by the content of my character, not the color of my skin. It should neither be a sword nor anything else. Judge me by the content of my character. Thank you. Mrs. Farage. Thank you. Um, if it comes to the DEI issue, I probably represent the most DEI candidate possible. I'm, I'm a recent immigrant. Not only I'm an immigrant, but I'm an immigrant from a communist country. Uh, once my generation dies, I don't think I'm a, kind of like a relic, will not be anybody left to remember how it was to be uh, growing up under, under, under communist conditions. Um, speaking of that, I don't think that DEI can be achieved by policies. I think DEI should be achieved by education, uh, educating everybody to their potential and expecting from everybody their, their best um, people will people will rise to the occasion. I'm 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 sure of that. I've seen that happen. Um, and so, DEI it's a it's a concept that that um, it's so charged with so much controversy because it, it, it can mean so many different things to to different people. Um, you talk about sex, gender, color, educational background history, backgrounds, and so on and so forth. So I don't think we can have a policy that puts that forth. Thank you. All right, the next question, we'll start with Ms. Lewis. Volunteering as a public servant is hard. You will have to dedicate your time, resources, and skills selflessly to a district of approximately 11,000 students that need stable and dynamic leadership. What have you done in the past that indicates you are qualified to serve in this capacity? Thank you for that. And um, I think, uh, as I mentioned before, I've done a few things in terms of uh, brainstorming new ideas and bringing new solutions to the forefront. 
Uh, my, my time, as, I, as you all know, it's, it's difficult to be on this stage. It's a hard process to be here, but um, we don't take this lightly. And I think uh, in terms of what it is, what it means to serve, it means to bring back um, those same unique ideas, those same um, opportunities for brainstorming back to the place that I love. Um, I've, like I said before, I've worked directly with in terms of taking data and using that data to create new solutions. Um, I'm also responsible for uh, the new teacher onboarding support. Um, and so that means that every new teacher that goes through me, uh, I have data for, which means I can turn to principals and turn to superintendents and say like, hey, um, I know that you are trying your best, but you have a small gap here in terms of what your teachers are saying about their experience. Um, and here's what we can do to help. And so I think that mindset and that frame of mind is what I'll be using um, in New Rochelle as well to think of like, hey, this is the data that we have. There might be gaps in that data. What does that look like? Um, and making decisions based on that data to help our principals and help our, our incoming superintendent so that he feels um, secure in the decisions he's making, that our principals feel secure in the decisions that they're making, um, and that we all as a team are brainstorming those new ideas. I don't see any reason why innovation shouldn't be at the forefront of all, all of what we do. I've done that so far, and I, I plan on continuing to. Thank you. Mr. Malfitano. Well, I know I may not qualify as that, but my life's work has been this stuff. Uh, after work, I've always volunteered many hours as a tutor. God knows how many other things in New York City schools. Uh, as I said, I nearly 40 years as a full-time teacher administrator. But also in, in my private life, uh, with my legal background, I, many many hours of pro bono work many hours of trying to help folks that you know i don't really make a big issue of it but perhaps the the thing that may serve a bit and <laughs> maybe it doesn't fit with some of you i i go to so many board meetings and community meetings and speak and offer thoughts constructive ideas i hope to try to make our schools and community better for all of us I show up, okay, I'm there. I don't know about everybody else, whether it's a recent calling, but for nearly 30, 40 years, you've been seeing me at board meetings, offering my opinions and ideas. Plus I'm retired after my life's work. I don't get around as easy as I used to, but I've lived in town with my family for 45 years and I would like to offer my service to this community with my years of experience and my concern for this town. As a single guy, I saved my money and bought a small house down by Shore Road. I hope you think about some of these things rather than just political emails. We might wanna try something else to help our town folks. There's a lot of issues that need work. And don't know if everything's been working with the same old, same old every year. Thank you. Mrs. Farage. As, as a mom of uh, the, the two children that were in school in, uh, in New Rochelle, uh, I volunteer a lot while they were in school. I, I was a very, very involved parent. I never missed an activity. Um, never missed a parent-teacher conference, never missed an opportunity to, to serve on committees. Um, and now that I am, um, we are empty nesters and the children are accomplished, uh, it's the same sense of community that I would like to give back to, to the neighborhood and to the city that to, we, we call home. Um, I think my, uh, my experience of being an immigrant and succeeding in this country will be uh, beneficial and uh, some of the uh, oh, obstacles I, uh, I uh, conquered will be uh, inspirational um, for the community and help make uh, inspirational for others to serve, not just, just myself, but I, I feel like I would want to inspire other people to serve alongside. Thank you. Mr. Vega. Yeah, um, thank you. And, and yeah, just in terms of professionally, I, I've managed multi-million dollar budgets. I'm a media buyer, multi, managed multi-million dollar budgets for more than uh, 25 years. Um, 
large scale projects in, in the private sector where there's a lot more accountability and moreover, um, served on committees going back more than 30 years, going all the way back to, uh, to college at CCNY. Um, but to, to clarify though, the board is not a teaching, a teaching role, right? There's, and the board is not an administrative role. The board is a community board that is ensuring that the mission of the district is being fulfilled. They, they don't supervise any principals. They don't get involved in any dispute. They don't get involved in, you know, even, even the issues with busing and all of that. That's all under the superintendent. But, but going to the heart of the matter, nothing is going to change really unless we all come together as a community based on the issues that we've been talking about for the past few years and make that change. We've already seen that we've had eight superintendents in nine years. We've had plenty of people churn through the board. We need more community engagement. We need more of the organizations in the community to come together from all each side of town and really nail down the issues that are going to help the most in need students quickest. Then we'll start seeing this incremental change that we're talking about and an improvement over uh, the long run. And as a as a proud change agent and a proud social justice warrior, you know, I, I'm proud to say that I will I will be that change for the board and actually make some of these things uh, happen. Thank you. Okay, next question. Mr. Malfitano, we'll be starting with you this time. Ongoing two-way communication between the school district and parents is key to building strong partnership and trust. In your opinion, how important is parent input and feedback in shaping the district policy? Well, it's very important. They recently established an Office of Community Engagement, uh, and that's a good thing. Um, I know the, the board and the superintendents and the various ones have tried to reach out to various uh, efforts. They've had the town meetings, uh, which seem to be nice. But again, um, as was said earlier, and Mr. Vega is correct, um, the board does not organize its meeting in a very engaging way. Uh, if you go to City Hall, the citizens to be heard, it's at seven o'clock, you can speak and you'd be out of there by 7.15. Now, many people like myself and others have for years implored the board, please, please make public speaking, maybe before you have the presentations. Maybe people just wanna come and get home to their family. Instead of sitting there till 9.30, 10 o'clock at night. Now I've done it. My wife is a very uh, forgiving person. <laughs> but for those of us in our community, don't you think our board can take a look at the structure of how the agenda is placed? It doesn't seem like rocket science. So let's work on these things. I'd like to work with the board to try to make our schools more accessible, more open, more transparent to everybody. Like I said, this election in and of itself speaks volumes to how the plaque has filled the arteries of change in our community. This will not change. The powers that be do not want change. They want power. Vote for change. Mrs. Farage. I think the relationship, uh, a good relationship between parents and teachers is paramount to the education of the child and to the well-being of the child. In our own experience, we had many, many, many divergences between what the, my children were being taught at school compared to our own values and influences. Um, and many times my daughter would say, you don't know anything. All you do is stay home all day. My teacher knows best. Um, middle school and elementary school are formative years for the children. And I feel like the parents should have a greater voice in one way or another. We must find a way where the parents' voice should be counted for more in terms of the education of the child. Um, recently, I read 
several articles about famous people being surprised about certain topics that the kids were uh, exposed to and they had no idea about how much information was given to the child uh, that was not always in line with what the parents were expecting from the educators. Uh, teachers are not de facto parents to the children. Uh, parents are still responsible for making all the choices for the children and they are more vested in the child than the teachers are. So again, the collaboration between the parents and the teachers, it's paramount to a, to a healthy development of a child. Thank you, Mr. Vega. Can you just repeat the whole question again? Yep. Ongoing two-way communication between the school district and parents is key to building strong partnership and trust. In your opinion, how important is parent input and feedback in shaping the district policy? Well, it's hard to, you know, when you say how, how important, of course, it's going to be very important. It's not, it's not about the degrees in which you measure the importance. It's about, well, how are you going to channel that, right? How are you going to gather that? How are you going to better engage the, the parents in the process? You know, no one's going to say that the, the parents role should be limited because of, of, you know, because it's too hard. We have to, we have to create ways to create those streams of information. As, as I said earlier, the feedback loop with parents to say, well, if you can't, if you can't come to a meeting or if you can't engage, then let's collect everyone and one person will come to the board meeting and read everyone's statement. Let's have sub subcommittees on certain issues like hiring, like special ed of parents who have gone through the process so we can get their information. How many parents have actually gotten any surveys from the board in, in the past years, just asking about their students? asking about the school, asking about the services in the community. So have we gotten any, any surveys? Have the students ever been surveyed in terms of what they're looking for, what kinds of programs, what kinds of career opportunities they would be looking for, what kind of activities and interests that we could start building on that will make them you know, more excited to come to school, more excited to go to class, more excited to get better grades. We have to get smarter about things. We have to use technology. We have to use the resources that we have, like our our infrastructure, but also the people are going to be the best resource. The more people that we get, just like in this room, how great it looks to have even this amount of people. If we get more and more people as part of the process, I guarantee you that things will change and also parents will feel a lot better because even if things are kind of, you know, then at least they'll say, well, at least I know, you know, at least I'm part of it. At least I, I'm getting that information back from the district about what's going on. And that's really the biggest complaint that I hear that we, when we hear we're canvassing is like, well, I, I call them, they don't call me back. Oh, I don't know what's going on. Oh, I don't know what's over here over there. I don't know where to go. So communication is key. That's time. Thank you. Ms. Lewis. Um, so I come from a, a, a long line of uh, educators. My grandfather was an educator um, in New York City, and my father currently is a special education teacher at Title I school. Um, and so many evenings I'll come home and hear my father in the den um, calling parents uh, day after day to see if they can share their input and let him know what, you know, what he might not know about their own students. So for me, I think from day one, it's always been shown to me that parent input is important. And I think in terms of how we include parent input in terms of the decisions that we're making, it's going to be just as imperative, right? Whether we're talking grades in the classroom or what we should put forth at the, um, at the, the school board. Uh, one example of that, I was speaking to another parent and they were saying that they were very happy that the board had put money towards um, capital improvements to fix up the high school and Barnard, um, but they still had issues at ward school and there was still a vermin problem and they had problems with AC and air conditioning. Um, and I wouldn't have personally known that had I not spoken to our parents, right? So even though we have great intentions of, of putting capital uh, towards fixing our buildings, we might be missing a few things. You might be getting at the high school and miss ward, for example. Um, and our parents will also be the, the cornerstone of, of us thinking about how we think about our social emotional support for our students, right? We're coming out of a post-COVID era. We can't forget that, right? Our students are still trying to readjust to this life and, and come back into a new space. It's going to feel different. It is different. Um, and so our parents are going to be a part of that equation to make sure that they're, you know, mentally supported and that mental health is still at the forefront of what we're thinking of as we get into this new era. Thank you. Mrs. Faraj, we'll start with you for the next question. If elected, what do you see as your learning curve? How will you foster a spirit of collaboration between your colleagues? How will you strengthen the relationship between families and the district? 
thank you. I feel like um, my first uh, my first priority, if elected on the board, will be to learn about how the board operates, to learn about uh, the issues that the board is facing, and to prioritize those issues um, in 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 an order that they can be uh, addressed. Um, Mr. Varga mentioned the special ed. Uh, Mr. Marfamante mentioned um, uh, freedom of speech. So there are it's a variety of issues that the board uh, has to deal with. So I feel like my, that will be my first my first priority would be to learn um, and to help prioritize the the, the issues. Um, also meetings with the principals. Um, learning from past experiences in terms of the hiring process for the superintendent. And of course, speaking to parents about their priorities and their need for information. Um, additionally, the board is mainly concerned about education, but let's don't forget that in this community, we have also a whole host of other individuals who might deserve our attention, such as senior citizens or retired people who might need to have access to um, continuing ads, uh, classes for enrichment or just for socializing. Um, this will broaden the participation of the community and hopefully uh, help th get things done. Thank you, Mr. Vega. Yeah, that's that's a that's an interesting question. I think that really, and to be honest, my my biggest learning curve would be kind of a lot of the social, the social aspects like the cocktail parties and the the galas and you know all of that. Yeah, because I was at one the other night and I was just I was like I, I didn't know what to do with myself because, like like I said, I'm more you know more focused on the work. So I think that a lot of the other things will be more along my lines, like. Uh, the legal policies and the board bylaws and the processes and Robert's rules of order and such, because those are things that I've been doing for, for many years. But but yes, trying to have that also to build those relationships but with, with people to strengthen those relationships, to try to, like I said, to try to build more of a coalition amongst different organizations and different communities in New Rochelle. So then we can actually get change done. No, again, because no one board member is really going to come in and and just start making changes. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. And again, like like I said earlier, families, families in the district, it has to be more convenient for them. It has to be easier. You know, think about before, because I because you know, because I'm, you know, I, I look younger than than I am, but but when I was, we didn't, we didn't have like the computers and the internet. We had computers, we didn't have the internet like yet, right? So a lot of the things we do on the internet, it's like, it's easy. You can join the PTA, you can send a message, you can go, you could watch this, watch this forum on, on Zoom. There's a lot of things that we could do to make that, that got easier for us, right? To give us easier access. We have to lean into that more to say, well, how can we use those tools and other tools to say, let's make it easier for the parents. Let's make it easier for the teachers. Let's make it easier for the students to all better engage. And then this way that we can get back to the fundamentals because the work is supposed to be done really in the classroom, right? Not like us trying to struggle in terms of how to talk to each other. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Lewis. Uh, yes, that's a very interesting question. I think for me, um, though, I, though I do like networking in the galas, um, I, for me, mine would be the, the educational law. Um, I am familiar with educational law, but I think we'll be able to get a really deep dive into what that looks like um, and how it plays out in real life. It's one thing to see a law in books and then see how it plays out in person, um, right, and in, our, and in our school. So I think um, figuring out what that looks like in New Rochelle specifically versus just education law at, um, at broad, at large, um, will be my learning curve, but I'm excited to dive in. Um, and learn all about that. I think for me, my strength is listening, um, whether that's listening to our community members, uh, the current members of the board um, and their historical knowledge, right? You're joining a team. And so they're joining a team of people who've been there before you. And so um, getting a sense of what they've gone through and, and um, the ins and outs of what their experience has been like would be really helpful. Um, obviously continuing listening to the parents, which I've been doing this entire campaign and listening to our students, right? Like they, they are who we serve at the end of the day. Um, no matter which side of the table we fall on, it's for them. And so um, I think thinking about elevating their voices and, and listening again, I think is my, my greatest strength. 
Thank you. Mr. Malfitano. Uh, yes, well, learning curve is important. One of the things in our district that was always very good uh, when I ran for the board back in the 80s, believe it or not, uh, was the longevity of our board members. We had board members like Ms. Rennington and others serving for 25 more years. Those are the people that can teach newcomers as to the ropes. But as of over the last several years, we've had many board members quit, resign, leave. Mr. Warhit was gone. Uh, Mr. Cooper got elected. He's gone in a few months. Uh, now Mr. Uh, uh, Peters gets elected last May, and now he doesn't want the job anymore. He wants to be a city councilman. So uh, we're, we're losing our superintendents and our board people on our historical knowledge. That's a problem for the learning curve. So what's wrong here? Well, I don't know. You figure that one out. But uh, yes, uh, the board does a good job of helping our new people get trained. There are workshops and everything else. Uh, and, and maybe a guy like myself, I've been to so many board meetings, maybe I know a little bit more about how some of these things work than a few others up here, but that's okay. Uh, it's a matter of trusting your colleagues, working together as a team player for the common purpose. I don't think I'd get on the board and start making phone calls to the state of New York and asking for investigations uh, with state people like it's been suggested by someone else tonight. Uh, I, I'd like to work uh, collegially with, with my members to see if we can come to some kind of consensus to make things better for everybody. Now, my opinions may not be what yours are, but don't you think that might be actually healthy for our district? Our high school is now ranked in the pretty percentile nationwide. We used to be a blue ribbon school district. We have many issues affecting us now. Dynamic change is happening as we speak. Think about it, folks. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Vega, you're starting off this time. What is your opinion on the current location of Huguenot Academy? With the increased enrollment, do you feel that the programming and space is sufficient to support the students? No, I think that, in, and for everyone, the Huguenot Academy is the campus school. Uh, and it was, I guess it was moved from St. Gabe's to the high school. And then now it's in a space at Monroe College. I'd say that those are our students. They should be in, in one of the buildings in the district. We should be able to find space for them. If we can't, then we should be able to try to build space or find space because we're always gonna have some sort of campus school. We're always gonna have some sort of alternate alternate high school. We should probably even be expanding that. So then if, if a student needs to, you know, maybe get a job during the day and, and go to classes at night for their GED, then we can, we can create pathways for that. Uh, but in terms of the Huguenot Academy, it should be on one of our campuses, if not the high school, and it should be included again in, ter in terms of all the other activities in the district. It kind of it can't be sort of set as if it's some some faraway place, you know, or it's just a, some other building. Um, and even where it is now, it's kind of by uh, by New Rock, so it's kind of it's not even near any other really uh, any other schools. So. Uh, I think that it should definitely be incorporated into one of the buildings. My idea would be to build something in the Lincoln attendance zone, either uh, a younger grade or some sort of specialized high school. And then if you had a specialized high school, then it wouldn't be going back to that same thing where we had red lines and then there was a black, black high school and a white high school. You'd have a specialized high school. And then the space that you made at the high school, then we could have the campus school uh, at the high school itself, because high school is big, but you know it's filled, it's it's filled to the rim. But it should not stay at Monroe. I think that we're paying, I think it's, you know, it's got to be like twenty thousand plus a month that we're paying just to lease the space. You know, so it's like okay, twenty thousand dollars a month. You know, what, what could we do for that? Could we maybe find space in one of our buildings or something, or long term build another space? Long term, we need a plan because uh, the campus school is not a temporary thing. It's always going to be part of the the district family. That's time. Thank you. Ms. Lewis. 
Uh, yes, I agree. Um, but I think that the uh, we don't want to keep uh, overcrowding our high school, but it is a part of our school, right? So we don't want to uh, alienate anyone who's a part of that, um, that as well. I think um, we see a lot of development going around up around New Rochelle and a lot of buildings going up and things are shifting and moving. And I think this is a good time for us to, to pause and work um, with our city to think about what that space could be and where it could be. Um, I, I do agree that if it's if they were able to save some money um, and, and not spend a couple thousand dollars a year, uh, not just a couple but a lot of money in terms of renting space that if that's something that we can do if that's something that we have to put into the plan of like the future of new rochelle that it's worth looking into um i do i do i don't want to alienate anyone in terms of um pathways to to learning right whether whether that looks uh what people consider untraditional but it's it's a it's an option and we should support them thank you mr malfatano Yes, well you know we, as i say i've spoken to a lot of the building leaders around and i don't want to quote you know, anybody's conversations with me. The 80 or so students over there uh, in that spot, you know, they try to survive in their own little place. They feel comfortable there, but they are deprived of many of the activities and things that are associated with the campus, like the high school. It's very difficult to try to arrange all these things you know, they don't have their own kid of food is delivered to them. They have to go out for their activities. Look, I'm not saying I have the answers for these things. I do think the way that the St. Gabe's thing was handled was a fiasco of the highest order. But I don't need to revisit that with you. But here they are over there on Huguenot Street in that in that spot. And, and, and they're trying to get along. But what I would really hope we can do as a community is to look at these kids, look at their parents, and look at the, the goal that we have in mind. These are not kids that are, you know, uh, to be segregated from us. These are kids that feel more comfortable in another environment. Okay, is there another way to accommodate this and to achieve the goals of a more unified kind of learning experience? I would hope so. Uh, money may be an issue, maybe another facility. There are, there are things out there that we can talk about. I don't have the answer for you, but I'm open to suggestion. I don't have an agenda. I'd like to hear what people have to say. I hope that's a good thing. I worked, I, I used to run an alternative high school for court sentence juveniles. That's not these kids. So I know the sensitivity of kids who just don't seem to fit in everywhere. Thank you. That's time. Mrs. Farage. Thank you. Uh, I was thinking about the Uganat School today, Academy today too. And to the point of saving money, I think uh, a solution might be to, to buy the building instead of renting the building and expand upon, upon that building to make it more accessible to other, other students as well. And maybe rotate the students, uh, I don't know, the frequency. Again, it's, it's, a, it's very complicated and, and I, I'm not sure exactly what the best solution might be. Um, but to the point of the academy, we also have to think about um, what will happen on all the buildings that are being built on uh, in downtown New Rochelle are going to be occupied and it's going to be a new population of students. Somehow, somewhere, we have to expand our classroom size and, and, uh, and maybe purchasing that building might be a solution. So it can be used all the time. Thank you. All right, Ms. Lewis, we'll start with you for this question. What do you know about the Special Education Department of New Rochelle and the recent audit of our Special Education Department? How will you support the families, students, and teachers who are a member of the special education community? Thank you, that's a great question. Um, I, I mentioned a bit earlier tonight that I had the uh, the privilege of attending the uh, NSEPTA dinner this past week and um, being able to see our, our not just our, our, our folks that are working in our schools, but our teachers celebrate themselves and then celebrate our students um, and just amplify the work that our students are doing. I think um, in terms of what uh, could be done better when I when I mentioned speaking to um, that one particular parent about IEPs um, and the transparency around that, um, I think it's a, a great step that we do now have the opportunity for 
for families to get um, uh, help in that field. I know that it's, it's very expensive for, for parents to get assistance um, in terms of getting their students uh, IEPs, that the entire process of getting tested is very expensive and getting help um, outside the school district is very expensive. And so um, anything that we can do to support our special education teachers uh, and, and the folks that and such as well in terms of developing uh, pathways for support, developing pathways to um, you know help them do what they do best. And I think it's all about elevating who we already have in our in our schools. I think that the, the teachers that we have are great teachers, uh, and then it might just be about um, supporting folks. And so um, there's always room for improvement uh, for any report that comes out. There's always room for improvement. I think we have a good foundation, and we'll just use the the results of that to move forward and and create a better New Rochelle. Thank you, Mr. Malfitano. Well, again, uh, this was my life's work as a teacher. Um, I did supervision of special ed in New York City and elsewhere, very active in the field um, most of my life. But here in New Rochelle, as I mentioned earlier, we have a growing special ed population. Uh, when I met with some of the building leaders, one of the concerns they expressed was they need more small space in their schools. They need rooms for counselors. They need rooms for the psychologists, the people that are servicing the kids with the IEPs. I, I started my professional career not too many years after the Jose P decision. Uh, that's how old I am. But here in our district, uh, we now see a, an effort, I don't know how far it'll get, to try to expand our services so that we don't have to have kids bust out to other schools. Now that would be a big help. And for parents who have a child in need, a child who has special needs that need help, you will not have a better advocate on that board than me. I have seen these children up close and personal since the 1970s. Thank you. This is my work. I hope you would trust me on that. Thank you, Mrs. Farage. Um, I must confess I'm not aware of the audit that was done for special ed in uh, New Rochelle. However, I have very fond memories of the time I subbed in uh, New Rochelle elementary schools, especially in Trinity. Um, I remember the special ed uh, area was like extremely well organized and extremely helpful and I've seen um, teachers and providers of services giving great, great, great care to their students. Uh, this has been, you know, many, many, many years ago. So I feel like in terms of um, uh, an answer to the, to the question, I would have to educate myself to the needs of the uh, special ed community in New Rochelle. Thank you. Mr. Vega. Thank you. Um, well, speaking as an, an actual parent of a special ed student, I'd say that, um, I, don't, I don't even want to be I don't even want to be too negative, but it's a, it's a, it's, it's not a good story. You know, as I said, one, we're, sp we're sending $9 million out of the district next year. That's 25 cents on every dollar that we could be investing in our, in our schools to service more kids with special needs. And instead of we're putting it in someone else's pocket, just like we're doing with the Huguenot Academy, we're teaching, we're giving kids services for special ed and other services in the hallways of schools, which is not only humiliating, but also a violation of state regulations in terms of, in terms of instructing students. We're ghosting parents that are having trouble placing their students in the high school or elsewhere and just not calling them back for a month or two. We have a law firm, Will, that let's say, is not, is, not, is not into customer service, is not into resolving it for the parents' best interest and the students' best interest. So what are we doing? Are we, are we stressing out parents that are already going through a tough time with their, with, their, with their kids and trying to beat them in some game because we can't handle it in our schools and, and we're just trying to find different places? I know about that particularly because there's only a few schools in the, probably in the entire state that could handle my son. So I know that very well as a special ed parent, we need a whole review of it. And this is, this is work within the board's scope of authority because the board's one of the primary, 
One of the primary responsibilities of the board is to make sure that the district is following all state policies for special education and students with disabilities. So like I said, day one, that's gonna be, that's what we're gonna be looking at because there's no way that, that I could be on a board and we're not in compliance with, with special education in, a, in our district. Thank you. Okay, next question, Mr. Mal Malfatano, you'll be starting. Current school district policy language is written in a way that is not easily understood by the average community member. What are your recommendations for proving understanding of the district policies? Well, I've attended many policy meetings, uh, the subcommittee of the board, and I've watched them work. And I know that they've been making an effort to achieve what you're, you're talking about. Uh, I don't want to be overly critical of, of, of their efforts. I, I think they're making reasonable progress in doing so. Some of the policies, and I've pointed this out, uh, like the code of conduct and, uh, uh, geez, I wish I could remember the other one, uh, the discipline code, uh, have contradictory language. And I've pointed it out. Don't, I, I hope that you uh, take it to heart. Look, this is not simple work to write policies that match with ed law, federal law, and everything else. But uh, if, you, if you have some thoughts, anybody in this room or the PTAs, I'm sure you guys communicate these things. Come to a policy meeting. They'll let you talk for a minute or two and send them an email. But yes, yeah, sometimes they do look a little bit uh, uh, archaic, cumbersome, and, and some hard to divine. But I think the board is making an effort at that. Uh, so I don't want to be overly critical of it. But yes, some of the policies are a little bit hard to really figure out. Thank you, Mrs. Farage. Being an immigrant and having English as my second language, uh, I, I'm a, I need to have the policies written. In, I'm a proponent of the plain language policies in terms of uh, having access to understanding and reading uh, the policies that our children are, and educators are supposed to adhere to, especially New Rochelle has such a large immigrant population, especially Hispanic speaking uh, population, we need to make sure that parents understand what the policies governing their educators are. So I, I think that we should address this uh, and adhere to the plain language rule that governs many contracts that people are dealing with in general. Thank you, Mr. Vega. Yes, thank you. And I think that I touched upon it yesterday when we talked about the budget. And, and to me, it's very simple from a, from a board member, let's say hypothetically, that I don't understand it. So I don't understand it, then, then I'm not voting for anything that I don't understand. We're going to have everything in plain language, not only in plain English language, but in plain documentation that then you could just take and then you could translate it. So you could say, oh, I just took it and I translated it to Creole, I translated it to Spanish or Portuguese. What, what is the point of actually going through this process if then you could, if you put an output that nobody can understand, right? Who's, who's, the, who's the end customer here supposed to be? Is it supposed to be the board or is it supposed to be the, the, the community and, and is part of the district, right? So if they're the end customer, they don't understand something, then what did you say that you didn't, you, you failed at something that you didn't really follow through with it? Everything has to be so plain that you should be able, if something comes out, you forward it to someone within five minutes, they understand it and then they can have questions and they can, or they can object or, or, or whatever. It's too much of, of everything going out into different directions and not clear policy. And this was also, this was also kind of, you know, clear during, during the pandemic, but the pandemic's a little bit more, was a little more complicated and different conflicting messages and such. But on a regular basis, how this should not be a hard thing. We show we should all be able to have a smooth process on a regular basis, and then again going back to what you said, then you're going to have a better engagement, better engagement from the community. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Lewis. Um, yes, I agree that that the uh, the policies that we write should be in uh, in very digestible language and uh, in accessible language. Uh, and in terms of accessibility, I think it should go uh, even past language, whether it's a QR code or a website or some other way to translate 
um, what's being said. Uh, we can also have interpreters, right? We do, I would be able to see that often in your shell as well. Um, so I think accessibility in general can be looked at in terms of making things easy to understand for our families. Um, and I think the, uh, for example, the, the attendance policy was updated recently. The board also mentioned some other policies that they were um, sunsetting and so then, you know, making it clear in terms of which ones um, were were current and almost up to date. And so I think that the, the board continuing to do that work to sunset the policies that are no longer relevant and updating the ones that are will make it even clearer in terms of what should be followed. Um, so I do want to applaud them for the, their current work on that. Um, and I think continuing that work, making language accessible, um, thinking about other types of accessibility in terms of making sure that our folks and families at home understand what's going on uh, is, is kind of like step one. Uh, the policies can be long, but we're, we're talking about policies that are used in the school building, right? So it's one thing for the board to know what the policy is uh, in terms of documentation, but then what does it look like when our principals are trying to use that policy, um, when our teachers are referencing that, when they're talking to, to parents? And so making it sure that it's digestible and easy to understand is not just for, for us in terms of the board members or people who will be on the board, but for those who are using it on a, on a regular basis. Thank you. Um, so this is our final question. Mrs. Farage, we'll start with you. Um, everyone will answer the question and then we'll go to closing remarks. How do you feel about our current magnet programs? Do you feel undoing the magnet program will bring some of the transportation costs down? And is this something you are open to explore? I feel magnet programs are great, and I would not uh, I would not want to um, not promote them further. Uh, transportation cost is an issue. Maybe the magnet programs can be be adjusted um, where they would be more accessible to the population within the within the uh, district. Um, Especially uh, the SILA uh, program, I think was it, it's, it's extraordinary in terms of helping students cross the bridge and uh, by students crossing the bridge, the community gets stronger. Um, I know it's a little hard for, for students to travel. You add the time um, on top of their daily, daily, daily schedule. But overall, I think it's a great program. And this is one of the things that attracted us to New Rochelle schools. Thank you, Mr. Vega. Yes, thank you. Um, what, I, what I found is I think that I have trouble with the question because I wonder why, why, why do we feel that we have to get rid of programs because it's a transportation issue, you know? We shouldn't, we shouldn't let the transportation challenges dictate whether a student's gonna be in a magnet program or not, right? Because if they, they have the opportunity to be in that magnet program, we should be trying to lift them up. We should be trying to find instead solutions to the transportation problems, you know, and we, and this constantly comes up with any kind of program we have. How do we have the, the after school programs, right? How do we have the mentoring programs? How do we have more clubs? How do we have all of the other activities when we have to bus large numbers of students across town? So the answer is not, we should be expanding our magnet program. I was a magnet student as well. We should be expanding our magnet program. We should be giving every opportunity, even to students that, that struggle a little bit, if they can be lifted to get into the magnet program, then do that. And then instead really look at our transportation challenges district-wide, long-term, how can we challenge, how can we, solve these things? How can we alleviate these things? Why are, why are large chunks of students always traveling on the bus and have these huge commuting times and waiting on buses that are idling with, with pollution and such like that? Why can't we really find solutions to that where we, we can't even find solutions to the traffic jams around our schools? So these kind of things shouldn't be as large challenges as they always appear to be to us. Every, every district has the same challenges regarding regarding busing. A lot of them, they go much farther distances and they're able to figure it out. We should be able to do that by having more of an in-depth study in terms of our transportation uh, district-wide. Thank you. Ms. Lewis? Thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, I am for looking into that um, and, and much more for me anyway, much more than just for transportation issues in terms of the cost. Um, that, um, of course, is, is, is a thing, right? Like we want to think about the budget always in terms of what the, the dollars are going to cost us. But for me, it's a more of a bigger issue. So I, I, when I think about this, I'm thinking about um, how our schools can partner with each other across the city. 
to make themselves better and make themselves greater. I'm thinking about um, how we can, um, you know, obviously eliminate the commutes for our children, how we can also kind of create uh, community schools, if you will, if I can use that phrase. So when I think of community schools, I'm thinking about serving the whole child and serving the family that comes with said child, right? So whether it's a parent or guardian, but what are we doing to support them? What are we doing to support the student? And so if we're thinking about how to do that in terms of community school type of format, um, and less about magnet school specifically, then we're going to be thinking about how to how to do that, how to cater to the entire family um, and that student. And so for me, I, I would like our schools in terms of um, whether or not we, we we stick this with this, like consider looking at it, because I think if we think about, you know, using a community lens, um, it would help alleviate both of those in terms of what we can do moving forward and also help with the budget, help with the commuting time, uh, et cetera. Thank you, Mr. Malfitano. Well, the concept of magnet programs is certainly uh, an old one around, and we've we've adopted it years ago in various buildings. The concept is 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 good, but the transportation issue is a real one, and and it must be addressed. When I met with various school leaders that had magnets, or even like um, Barnard is a little different, the big issues with getting kids getting picked up, and parents calling in. No bus showed up this morning. So look, if we're going to have these programs, which I think are good, we had best get our hands on this stuff because a lot of the parents are getting very frustrated with it. And I know the superintendent the other day mentioned that uh, to try to go out with a RFP of various uh, different bus providers rather than one massive bus outfit for the whole district. I don't know if that'll solve our problems, but the concept of a magnet program is good. The idea of having a specialized learning environment with teachers dedicated to that issue, I think is valuable, but we have to make the dynamics of it successful for the student. So I'm open to thoughts on it. Uh, there's always been talk in town about how the lotteries work and all this other business. And uh, that's procedural stuff that with equity, I think uh, the board can address these questions uh, in, in a way that makes people feel everybody's had an equal shot at it. But I think the magnet programs that we have are, are basically good programs, but you know, like many things in life, they, they need to be tweaked. Thank you. That concludes the question portion of this evening. Each candidate is going to have three minutes for closing statements. Mr. Vega, we'll start with you. Well, thank you. And first, I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. I mean, you really should give yourself a applause. You're better than everyone else who stayed home to watch. No, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding, please. I need everybody's vote. I want to thank PTAC for holding the forum. There's only going to be two forums, public forums, this year. Today and tomorrow, tomorrow's at the library. So if you know someone who can't make it tonight, tell them to come tomorrow. It's gonna to be at the library. It's gonna be the library candidates as well. Um, it's very important because again, there's only there's only two public ones. Um, the issues that we talked about, again, we have the opportunity to, to affect all of these different things that we talked about. Special ed, more support for teachers in terms of development and in terms of in-classroom support more support for even the student aides who, again, we talked about special ed, those same student aides that have been making 19.65 an hour since 2009, they're in special ed classes too. You don't get a dollar more for working in a special ed class, and yet we can't give them even a dollar raise. We talk about the infrastructure around the district in terms of programming, after school programs, mentoring, infra infrastructure like buildings where we can actually, we can build stuff. We're gonna build stuff by Columbus, and we can build stuff by Columbus, we can build stuff in other areas of town. I ask, you all, I ask you all to join in our campaign, not only to, to vote for me, but also vote for those issues and vote for those issues that are important that you've been seeing in our community for years and, and not affecting change. Uh, my website also is, is Vega4, the number four, neurochelle.com, and I appreciate it. And, and since I have an extra minute, I'm allowed to rebut another candidate, right, in my, in my, final, in my final comments, but Mr. Malfatano said something about me and about forces in New Rochelle and about to vote for, vote for Makita and I as if we're, we're on to some forces. 
when he just himself admitted that he ran first for the Board of Ed in the 1980s and ran several times in the past few years, right? And ran for city council as well of New Rochelle, right? All under the Republican Party. And was also in the, in the Facebook group last year who were doxing people, giving out people's uh, addresses and such just because they were supporting David Peters. And you got nerve also to come up here and say that special ed is your issue and no one else can be better at special ed than you. When you go to every single BOE meeting and all you talk about is Columbus Day and why you can't write for a half hour. Not one single time have I ever seen you mention any student, any special ed student or any ideas. What do you know about dynamic change? You're not the change agent up here. The other candidates, of the other three candidates, Lydia, Makita, and myself are the change. You've been here for years and it's only gotten worse in our community. Thank you. Ms. Lewis. Uh, thank you as well for, for coming out tonight. Thank you for everyone who's at home. Thank you for everyone who will be watching this. Thank you for sharing this link um, with your friends and family across New Rochelle. Thank you for being involved. Thank you for submitting questions um, for today and tomorrow. Um, it's really my pleasure, my honor to be here to speak to you all tonight and share some of my views and some of my values and some of my morals. Um, and so you have four of us on the stage today. Um, and you only have to elect two of us. There are only two seats. And so you have to choose the two people who you feel as though would represent New Rochelle the best. You have to choose the two people who you feel as though would, would fight for you and fight for the things that you care about um, and that want New Rochelle to be the best that we can be. Um, so a vote for me would be a vote for equity, inclusion, diversity, someone who's walked the walk and that has not just talked the talk. Um, voting for me would be a vote for data-informed decision-making. Um, voting for me would be also for voting for someone who can get along with others, can work collaboratively um, through difficult issues and through difficult topics and can keep our North Star, um, which is doing what we do for our students. Um, and, you know, I know I'm also someone who knows how to work in a bureaucracy. I've worked for government for many years and, and bureaucracy is not new to me. And so um, with that, I want to remind you all the election is May 16th. Um, please tell a friend to tell a friend. The polls open at 7 a.m. Uh, typically, New Rochelle has a very low turnout, so we'll appreciate going to the polls. We'll appreciate you bringing your friends to the polls um, and letting everyone know that this is important and important to you and important to all of us. Um, and so we hope to see you all on May 16th out and about um, as you vote. Thank you again. Thank you. Mr. Malfitano. Oh, yes. Well, this was a little bit interesting. I think you've seen the character of Mr. Vega, a gentleman that will win a seat to the board. I think it bodes well for our community, doesn't it? Well, I never ran for city council. I did run for state legislature. And yes, I did run for the board in the 80s. Anybody around here to remember that? I was new in town. I uh, had some years experience with the schools. And during a debate like this, I heard a lady speak that I became impressed with. Said she was a teacher at Albert Leonard, this and that. So I went over to the Standard Star, which used to be in town a few days before the election. And I said, I have a story for you. Mr. Malfitano withdraws from the election and endorses Mary Jane Reddington. That's who I am. We're finding out who Mr. Vega is. I'm a team builder. I believe in progress. I believe in truth. But yes, uh, we are seeing outside forces come into our community to help candidates win an election. Uh, a national political action committee organized by people uh, from the Clinton campaign are now supporting one of our candidates. Imagine that, something I ain't seen in my 40 some years, a national political action committee coming in for our little lowly school board election. Okay, if that's what we want, that's what we get. But you know, the simple truth of the matter is I stand on my record. I have never seen Mr. Vega at a board meeting. Walks a good game tonight. And, and he will win. The right lawns have the right signs on them. The right people are endorsing him. When he ran a few years ago, uh, when Miss uh, Brooks and Manaya, uh, he got 200 and something votes. Well, he will win this time because the powers that be want him there for you. You decide whether he is of character to be on this board, all right? The seven or 8% who are gonna decide this election, they think he is, and he's gonna win. 
and the Political Action Committee nationwide organized with Ms. Lipman from the Clinton campaign will elect your next candidate. And I don't know if the future has me ever sitting up here again, but I am proud of my advocacy all these years, proud of my commitment to this community with my blood, sweat, and tears. But those of you who are of a different mind will not vote for me. Okay. Just history as it is. But you're going to get what you vote for. Thank you. Mrs. Farage. Thank you. I want to thank everybody here first, uh, especially my husband, who's in the audience, who has always been my supporter ever since we met 30 plus years ago. Um, I am not, uh, I don't have the same resume and history and experience as my colleagues at this uh, forum. Uh, but what I want to say that I bring to the board um, will be respectful America, especially the universal education system that too many of us uh, sometimes take for granted. Uh, I also bring the appreciation for my community and the desire to give back to New Rochelle. Um, I want to tell you a couple of stories uh, because I was fortunate enough to be a stay home mom for most of my time, most of my kids' younger education. Um, my son was in second grade at Davis and uh, because I assigned the reading material, he was crying, 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 crying. And uh, I got called by the teacher at school um, and she showed me the book that I assigned to my son and it was Robin Hood Unabri Unabridged. I tried to read that book myself and I couldn't. So at that point I kind of like gave in and I gave him a, a, a little a easier book to read that he was able to, to finish reading. Uh, move forward, um, my daughter uh, applied to colleges. She got into 12 of the colleges she applied to, most of them with scholarship, some of them full ride. Um, among the schools that she applied to and she got in was Northeastern University who gave her zero money. Uh, guess what? That's where she went because she insisted and she cried, cried, cried that she wants to look up. She wants to be challenged. My daughter was in the top 25% of her high school, graduate, high school class. She did not want to look down anymore. She wanted to look up. And we mortgaged our house to pay for her education. And we're very happy we did. She's very uh, successful and we're very proud of her. Um, again, I, I feel like I was very, very lucky to be able to stay home with my kids and monitor their progress. Not everybody is in the same boat, I understand that. But I feel like if, if I get to be on the board together with all the other parents, I will make sure that I will work very hard to raise the education bar where our children can compete educationally with the whole world. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for your vote and for your presence here tonight. Thank you. And thank you everybody for coming tonight. Thank you candidates. For your time and dedication. Vote on May 16th.